how would you handle uh, the social media platforms right now and the censorship? What, what, what do you think we could do and what should we do? Well, just censor anybody who disagrees with me. <laughs> I mean, just let me do the censorship, obviously. Um, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, couldn't be worse. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem solved. Um, <laughs> uh, the, look, would you, you have, okay, so this is confusing because there are basically two major problems. There are two major problems in law that interact with each other in, in, and when the, it's the interaction that's the problem. So the first is the monopolization, which we've talked about. Okay. And one way to deal with that is to say, uh, if you are an important piece of infrastructure, whether you're AWS or you're Google or Facebook, you have to let everybody come onto your platform on equal terms, right? Sort of the same way that if you want to buy Verizon service, you can buy it at the same price for the same service that I can buy it for, right? They can't just discriminate against you because they don't like your politics versus me. This is a rule called common carriage, sometimes also known as public utility rules, but it, you know, it's, a, it's an equal treatment, equal services, Net neutrality is part of that. Civil Rights Act of 64 said, you know, if you're a hotel or restaurant, you have to serve all comers regardless of race. It's a, it goes back thousands of years, common carriage. Serve all comers, same class of service. Um, okay, if you were to do that, right? If you were to say you're a major piece of infrastructure, you would also be saying to Amazon, you have to carry Parler. Now let's say that Parler was knowingly contributed, contributing to political violence, right? Or knowingly contributing to dangerous, you know, harmful things, which, you know, I can bring you cases where like Grindr, for example, has really, has, has been negligent in how they handle safety issues, right? That, that that's Facebook has been negligent in how they handle fraud. Like, so if you were to say, you've got to carry these guys, then you're saying you have to carry violent, like the ability to organize violent insurrections and, and dangerous stuff. That's problematic. But that gets to the second problem. The second problem is a law that's called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Now, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is a legal shield that says that if you run a platform, this vaguely thing called an interactive computer service, then you are not liable for how people use that service. Right. They can use it to do all sorts of terrible things. You can know that they are using it to do terrible things and you are not liable for anything that happens. So now, there are a whole bunch of, of now. So, so can I just so, can so, I just let me let me a bunch of, let, right. let me just break that down for people. What you're saying is that the Section 230 law says that Twitter and Facebook are not considered publishers. So you can't sue them for anything bad that they publish. But. Uh, they're, they're more like a bookstore. So you don't sue the bookstore if there's something printed in a book that's libelous or some, you sue the publisher. So Section 230 allows them to actually act as publishers where they can censor stuff, but not be held responsible, uh, legally liable for stuff, correct? Is, am I getting it right? Yeah, that's right. Let me give you just a very clear example so it's obvious what, what the stakes are. So Facebook has this problem, there's this problem in the military where all these soldiers go abroad to fight and scammers impersonate them. They come up with fake profiles of real soldiers. They then flirt with lonely women and get those women to send them money, right? The idea being like, you're dating a soldier who's abroad, you've never met them, send me money, I need money for this or that or the other thing. The soldier comes home, this woman is like, now we can have a relationship for real. The soldier's like, I've never met you before, okay? This is a constant problem in the military. It always happens on Facebook. The New York Times did a story on this. Facebook could easily deal with the problem. They know what's going on. It's known harm. There are real damages. This would be a classic case of negligence. But Section 230 uh, prevents anybody from bringing a, a claim in court saying you are knowingly, negligently causing, you are knowingly causing harm through negligence. And you owe money for this. You need to put a stop to it. That's what Section 230 does. Another example, Grindr, uh, which is a gay dating app. There was a guy who one day somebody sit, showed up at his door. It was a guy who was demanding sex and wanted to do drugs with him. He was like, you've been flirting with me. You've been saying all this kinky stuff. This guy's like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, no, you've been saying it on Grindr. Over the next year, about a thousand men did the same thing. Some of them assaulted him. Um, they all thought he was wanted to have sex with them. Turns out it was an ex who was impersonating him on Grindr. And he couldn't get 
they got they got um, restraining orders against this ex, but he couldn't get Grinder to stop this guy from making fake, fake profiles because they didn't care. And he took him to court and said, this is, you are knowingly putting me in danger. And the court said, this is true. We would love to hold the grinder accountable, but section 230 blocks us from doing that. So there is known harm that these platforms are inducing, that they, that they just, it's like pollution. They are not, they don't care. They don't have to pay for it. So they pollute. It's, it's what's going on here. What that means, and this gets to the interaction between the first problem and the second problem, what that means is there's a whole bunch of content and behavior that should be illegal, but is effectively shielded by Section 230. This includes the stuff that I mentioned on Grindr and Facebook with the military scams, but it also includes things like organizing violent riots, right, which you shouldn't, you're not allowed to do, that is illegal, but because of Section 230, Facebook, which is probably where most of it was organized, isn't liable for it. Now. What that means is that you got a lot of illegal stuff that sh or a lot of stuff that's legal that should be illegal um, because of Section 230. And then if you say, hey, uh, you guys need to do common carriage here, you guys need to carry this, what they then have to do is carry a bunch of stuff that should be illegal but isn't through their, their platform. So, so the solution here is to say, but on the other hand, if you say, hey, private monopoly, deal with this bad thing, then you're saying, do this coercive, dangerous thing. Like you're saying, use your power arbitrarily to censor political people we don't like. And that is also very dangerous. That is coercive. That is what you're talking about. That is what a lot of the people that you folks. So the answer is pretty simple. Deal with both problems at once. Say, we're gonna get rid of section 230, so illegal stuff online becomes illegal, right? And then say, big tech, you have to serve all comers. And so you don't have to serve people doing illegal things, if stuff is illegal, if someone's being negligent, if they're you defamation or whatever, you don't have to carry that because that's illegal. But it's determined through a court, through public institutions, through laws. You have to carry everything else. And what that that and that's where the, the warlord analogy came from. It's like, don't let private warlords enforce arbitrary law to stop things you don't like. Make the stuff you don't like illegal and don't have warlords. Right. That's the whole point here. That's a, the rule of law. And like either way you deal with it, if you force these guys to carry stuff that should be illegal or if you say use our your arbitrary, coercive, monopolistic power to get rid of stuff we don't like, neither one is the rule of law. You have to solve both problems at once. So that's the, the kind of answer here. So how so let's apply that practically uh, right now. Let's let's say. Um... Alex, let, let's say Donald Trump let, let's, or, or Alex Jones, either one. And people would say, well, the the app had to intervene and censor them because what they were doing was hurting people. And what I always say is, if that's true, isn't there a isn't there a law to enforcement agency that's supposed to handle when someone else is doing something illegal and is hurting someone? Isn't there? A, because otherwise, now what we're doing is we're letting uh, unelected bureaucrats, nameless and faceless bureaucrats, determine what is free speech and what isn't. And so what do you say to that? Well, I mean, look, here's what I would say. Okay, Alex Jones does what he does. And there are always going to be Alex Joneses in a culture. But nobody cares if he's just on a street corner saying what he's saying. Who's responsible for Alex Jones? Obviously, Alex Jones. And you should, if he's doing something to incite violence, and there is a pretty high threshold for that in a court, but if you can prove it, you can prove it, right? Um, however, Google, because they want to addict you and keep you watching so they can sell ads, recommended Alex Jones to their users 15 billion times. Alex Jones is Alex Jones, but Google made him a star. YouTube made him a star with their algorithm. Now, who's responsible for that? I think that that Alex Jones, again, is, is responsible for Alex Jones. Google is responsible for making him a star. So if he causes harm, then Google should have to pay for part of that harm. And if they had to pay for part of that harm, they, they take your data, they process it, they put things in front of you, they should they bear responsibility for what they are doing. And there are different legal claims. You know, it, again, it's pretty, you know, the claim, it's hard to bring a defamation suit. It's hard to bring an incitement suit. It's hard to bring these kinds of suits. These are not easy cases to win, but 
you can win them if there's if they really are doing you know fraud or really bad things product liability problems you can win them so let it go to court so that's right? what so you're that's, that's, you're saying what Matt Taibbi said when he addressed the Alex Jones situation like there's a body of law that journalists have been working under for for decades yeah. and it works fine why can't yeah. we let the law work and people are like but there's bad things happening so we that's have right. to supersede the law you're saying don't do that you're saying let the law take its course right right what they're saying is we don't trust the state so let the warlord do it <laughs> yes right that's that and that's you know, that is certainly one way to handle a problem, but it isn't doesn't lead to, you know, self-government. Right. Like uh, the warlord's name might be like Mark Zuckerberg or, or Jeff Bezos, you know, and you might be comfortable with that person, but it's still a warlord. So, right? yes. It, so it couldn't. But my again, my point being. We can't leave it up to the interpretation of a nameless, faceless bureaucrat to decide who's inciting violence and who isn't inciting violence by their interpretation, right. because any organizing could then be considered inciting violence because there's potential for violence at this or at this rally. Or like, let's say I was organizing another rally uh, at the Capitol. They could say the last one was violent. So this one's got to be shut down, too, because it might because it's their interpretation. So, I mean, you've already seen this. You saw um they're trying to bring a case against a guy named DeRay McKesson because DeRay McKesson is a Black Lives Matter active, activist, and they brought a suit against him trying to hold him responsible responsible for a, a damage that was caused in a riot where he was. He wasn't rioting. He was just there. And they said, well, you're a prominent activist, so we're going to hold you responsible for this. I mean, they, he was let off because the claim wouldn't stand up in court. But the thing about these, um, the thing about these platforms is that they're not courts. There's no due process, so they That's could it. just say, "Yeah, you were there at a violent rally. We're we're getting rid of your ability to to be on Twitter, to be on Facebook, to be on Amazon, um, to sell your book, whatever it is. Like these are vital. Or you know, they they took they took Trump off Shopify. I mean, somebody pointed. They were like, "What what's the danger there? Is he going to sell too many red hats? I mean, what the what's the problem? It's just like at at this point." You know, what they're trying to do is they're trying to push a large group of people um, out of society. They're just trying to say, you're not you don't, you're not going to have representation. And that's a really dangerous thing to do unless, you know, there's real kind of due process and some sense yes. of legitimacy in how it's happening. And this is not due process. This is not legitimate. So I, I get. I, but the thing is, at the same time, you also have to acknowledge that what Trump did was wrong and also that some of this stuff is illegal. Yes. Right. And it shouldn't be happening. And right. now we should have law enforcement actually doing stuff yes. about it. That, but that, that, again, that's, we that's, you can agree that what Trump is doing is dangerous and it might even be illegal, but it's not for uh, Jack Dorsey to decide and you're arbitrarily and the way he did it was complete bullshit. He's saying the reason why he did it because Trump said he wasn't going to show up to the inauguration, which something Joe Biden agrees with. That's the reason. So do you see the problem? And so when I say what you're saying, Matt, I say it in a much louder way, in a more aggressive way. When I say that, that we need to stand up for the rule of law. Uh, people then say, why are you defending fascists? So how do you respond to that when you say, I, I'm, I'm, we need to have an, our, an, a transparent process if we're going to take away someone's freedom of speech? And when people, when you say that, people call you a fascist or you're defending fascists. What do you say to that? Well, usually I don't respond because, <laughs> like, I mean, it's not worth it. You know, I mean, it depends on the forum. I think, I think if you're in a... Um, uh, like on Twitter, for example, I, I've stopped responding to a lot of that because it's not worth it because that's just people are getting addicted to uh, to outrage and they want to just like go after you. And I'm, so I'm trying to pull back on that. I don't think it's good for me. So I'm sort of trying to pull back on that form that that, you know, so that's one thing is you don't have to respond to it. On the other hand, if somebody says, look, you're defending fascists, what you have to say is yeah. is yeah. that the right way to address dangerous, illegal behavior is to have the state and the police deal with it through the rule of law. And we, we all agree that you have to do that. The problem is you're not going to get, you're not going to defend, you're not going to retain a democratic society by saying, well, our fascists need to stop their fascists. We need, yes. you know, that's, that's the issue. Yes. And I, and that's where we have to get to. I think we can. Um, that's exactly your exact. So, there's an authoritarian streak in the left, and the left is very much for controlling other people's speech. 
And well, they, this is this is proving it. People are cheering this on, unaware of the unintended consequences. Well, there's a, there's a the, this is, goes back to something that's always been a problem, I think, on the left, which is a sense of romanticism. So the left. Many people on the left, and I think this is true across the board, not just on the left, but like a lot of left wingers are utopianists. They want a perfect world. Um, they genuinely do. They, it's not. This isn't like a. I'm not. It's not an insult. They just believe that we can solve all problems. Um, we can perfect our society. The the kind of revolutionary sort of fervor and spirit. And if you believe that we can we can we can perfect mankind, then any problem is a political problem. And I think that the issue here is that there are just going to be bad things that happen in the world and not everything can be solved through politics. So I think that like their emphasis on control and authoritarianism, and I, I don't think this is true across the left, but there's a lot of people in the left that are just romantics and they're just like, oh, if there's somebody somewhere being treated badly, that's a place for the state to go. And like, that's, that's a problem. That's a, that's a bad way to see the world. Um, and they don't, there is oftentimes isn't there's a tension between like respecting the personal sphere, respecting people's agency, which means respecting their ability to do shitty stuff and be assholes to each other as long as they're not doing anything illegal. And this desire to like create a perfect world um, and that and that like ult the ultimate like obnoxious strain of what we're talking about is like HR compliance bureaucracies. But that's like. And that's the like worst of everything, because that's like this left wing control freak aspect married to this right wing corporatism. Yes. I don't think it's pervasive across the left. I think the left is largely confused. Yes. But, and people do different things. But yes. they, I, I think it comes from a good place. It's just that yes. good intentions are not, are not enough. You yes. need to think clearly about human beings. So what? Yeah, exactly. Of course, it, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. So is the road to fascism. And right. so when, you know, when lefties are cheering on Donald Trump being censored and and the way that it's happening what they don't realize is they're siding with the corporation that that's really what they're siding with is big tech and the surveillance state that's really what they're siding with